During Jesus' time on earth, he told lots of stories called parables. Sometimes they were long stories and sometimes they were short, but they always conveyed some deep truth about the kingdom of God. Today, we will hear the story about the sower and the four types of soil. If you know the story already, what do you think Jesus is trying to teach? Who do you think they are in the story? There may be someone you have overlooked. If you're not familiar with the story, that's fine. You're about to hear all about it. So let's listen as Pastor Allen teaches us about Jesus' story of the sower and the soil. Well, good morning, church. How are you today? Excellent. Wonderful. I, uh, you know, the psalmist said, I was delighted when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hope you were delighted when they said, let's go to church this morning because uh, it's a wonderful place to be. I'm glad you're with us this morning. Uh, my name is Alan Smith. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I am one of the pastors here at Calvary. Uh, welcome. We are glad that you have visited and you are our guest today, uh, and we hope that you enjoy the service and the time we have worshiping our King. Uh, we're studying through the Gospel of Luke this morning, and today we're going to be in Luke chapter 8. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 8. Uh, if you have a smart device, you can open up the Calvary Ministries app and uh, click on the Today's Sermon, and all the information will be there. If you don't have the Calvary Ministries app, I would encourage you to go ahead and try to download it. Um, there's going to be a part in the service today where I'm going to go through a feature in the app that uh, I would like to kind of share with you a little bit. So if you have it, wonderful. If you don't, go ahead and download it, and uh, we'll kind of try to work through that at the end of the service. Um, since our service, to, our sermon today is Luke chapter 8, verses 4, talking about the sowing of seed and the, and the uh, sower, I thought that I would dress the part this morning. Thought I would dress like a farmer. This is my this is my sowing seed outfit. Uh, I am not a farmer, but I have seen on TV and movies that if you're going to be a farmer, you should have some overalls. So I thought I'd wear my overalls today just to kind of play the part, uh, at least uh, try to play the part. I <clears throat> I've tried farming, not like big row crop farming, like square foot gardening farming. Right? I, I tried to grow something. See my big farm there. You know, uh, I tried to grow something. I built me a small little box, and me and my son, we got out in the dirt, and I bought some, well, it was good dirt. It was, they wanted a lot for it anyway. And uh, I filled my box up with this dirt that uh, we got to play in, and, and we put all kind of stuff in there that you would want for a salad. So I got, some, I got some lettuce in there and some tomatoes and some cucumbers and some beans and some onions and... I, I just kind of planted whatever. I, that looks good. Let's put some of that in there, and that looks good. Let's put some of that in there, some pepper. I put all kind of stuff in there. We watered it. We tended that garden. And look, I got me an onion out of it. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? My little four-foot by four-foot by 12-inch garden, I got me a little. We, 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 we watered it. Me and Eli would go out, and we would make sure it got plenty of water, and we'd pull the weeds, and... We do all the stuff you're supposed to do. And after weeks of tending to this amazing garden, this is my harvest. You ready? Don't be jealous. This is my harvest right here. <laughs> That's everything I got out of all the effort that I put into this garden. Now, my brother, on the other hand, he's got like gardens of gardens of these little beds out there, and he just goes out and just wiggles a little something on it, and out comes these things. I, I had barely enough tomatoes to make a tomato sandwich with, and I had to open up a can of green beans to include these in it to even have enough to have a meal. I mean, it was not, those tomatoes are like just barely bigger than like a, like a little plum tomato. I mean, they're tiny, you know. All, both of those sliced up barely covered a piece of bread. It was terrible. So I'm no gardener. I don't, I don't claim to be a gardener. I did paint my thumb green one time thinking it would help. That did not help. So our text today is about sowing seeds, and the thing I'm happy about is the fact that I don't have to be a good gardener to be a good seed sower. So uh, if today is your first Sunday with us, uh, or you've missed a couple Sundays, maybe you've been serving in the children's or, the, or whatever around campus, uh, I want to kind of get you caught up a little bit with where we are. Uh, if you don't know where we've been, it's kind of hard to know where we're at and definitely difficult to know where we're going. So let me kind of get us caught up a little bit today in our study of Luke. Over the last several weeks, Jeff has been preaching um, through the book of Luke. <clears throat> in chapter 4, 
um, we see that Jesus stands up in front of the synagogue and stands up in front of the Pharisees, and he declares to the Pharisees and all that listens that the prophecy that was made by the prophet Isaiah about the Messiah coming has been fulfilled in their ears. The Messiah is here. He has fulfilled this prophecy in their presence. And in doing so, he then continued to preach in the area, and he continued to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. This was his message, the good news of the kingdom of God. In chapter 5, he deals with the Pharisees when they question him about his ability to forgive sin. All right? There's this guy who, was, who couldn't walk. And Jesus says, I forgive you of your sin. They're like, what do you mean forgive people of sin? You can't do that. And he goes, what is it easier for me to do? Tell him to get up and walk or forgive him of sin. Look, get up and walk. See, I can do both. He challenges them on, on who he is. He is very direct. He demonstrates his authority. He demonstrates his power. And he is very direct with what he says about who he is. In chapter 6, he talks about the fact that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And in that chapter, we also hear Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, where we hear Jesus makes some very direct and very clear, very intentional statements about who he is. He says things like, um, <clears throat> if you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, he makes some very bold and very strong statements. In chapter 7, we see John the Baptist's disciples coming to him and say, are you really the Messiah or we should kind of look for someone else? He goes, no, I'm really him. Chapter 8, the beginning of chapter 8, we see Jesus in Capernaum around the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, teaching and preaching. And the message that he's teaching and preaching is the same. He keeps teaching the message, the good news of the kingdom of God is here. The good news of the kingdom of God. And he goes from town to town. But in our text, chapter 8, verse 4, we see a change in Jesus' teaching method. One of the things I talk about in, in our life group class, one of the things we talk about, we go through study, we study scripture, I always try to point out this principle for biblical interpretation. If you're studying Scripture and, and things, a pattern all of a sudden changes, right? So things are going in this direction, and then all of a sudden there's a change in the way things have been moving. You, you just pause, look at that, because that may be important, right? A change in pattern in Scripture might be an important note to make. And so as you study the book of Luke, when Jesus is teaching at chapter 8, verse 4, there's a change in the pattern. Instead of teaching these direct, clear, very intentional messages that he does, he changes to being very vague, very hidden in his message by speaking in parables. Now, Jesus started using parables a lot, picking up here in chapter 8. <clears throat> and uh, Jesus would tell stories that related to what people were doing or what they could see in the area, right? So if you walk by a garden, he tells a story about a garden. Or if you're walking by a vineyard, he stops and tells a story about a vineyard, right? He uses the things that people could see. <coughs> and then in doing so, he's delivering a much deeper spiritual truth to the purpose of these stories. Um, you know, like when we were a kid, our teachers would tell us these stories like bear rabbit, you know, you throw you in the briar patch, right? And at the end of these stories, the teacher would always say something like, and the moral of the story is, and they give you some life lesson, or they try to tell you some kind of moral um, thing to do, these, these stories. Well, a parable is similar. A parable is a similar thing. It, but instead of trying to tell you a life lesson or some moral direction to apply to your life, it's trying to help you understand or communicate a deep spiritual truth. So parables are important, but the problem with parables is that they are intentionally vague. You wouldn't want to build theology out around a parable because they're intentionally vague, right? They're intentionally that way. <clears throat> the parable of the soil is the first parable that we find in Scripture. Um, it's recorded by, all, by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Synoptic Gospels record this parable. This is an important one because this is the first one. His teaching method is going to change. Jesus is going to go about making disciples become better disciples. And so when he teaches to the general public, he now begins to teach in parables. And then when the, he and the disciples are together, he begins to expound upon the meaning of this, of this parable. So the public begins to hear parables, and he's doing this as a means to make things a little confusing for them but more clear and intentional to his disciples. So parables, they tell, he tells stories. So this morning in chapter 8, <clears throat> we're going to read beginning in verse 4. We're going to read through verse 15. And I'd like for you, as we go through this passage, 
make some observations. What do you see? What do you notice? Now, <clears throat> I dare say that we're all, most of us anyway, are probably very familiar with this story. We've heard it before. We've heard our children's church or children's stories or something of this nature. But read it anew today. As we read through it, see if there's some things that maybe jump out to you in a different way. <clears throat> make some observations. Here's we go. Here we go. Chapter 8, verse 4 says this. And when a crowd gathered, <clears throat> when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town to town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the path and were trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when the disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. <clears throat> and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they heard, received it with joy. But they have no roots. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. As for the, what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. And as for that which is good soil, they are those who hear the word, hold to it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. <coughs> I'd like to point out three observations that I make as I read this text. Three observations. Number one, the soil condition is God's responsibility. The soil condition is God's responsibility. Uh, who is the subject of this parable? Like, who's the action? Who's doing the action? Who is the actor? The sower, right? This is a parable about the sower, right? The seed is simply, I mean, the soil is simply information for us to know how the seed is being thrown about. The soil simply is what it is. We don't see it changing, we don't see the seed sower cultivating it, tending it, changing it. He's not plucking out weeds. All we see is the seed sower sowing seeds. The person in the story is not doing anything about the soil. The sower is about sowing seeds, and the soil is not his responsibility. You see, you and I are going to come in contact with people every day who are somewhere along this spectrum. They're either going to be hard, they want to have nothing to do with the gospel, or they're joyfully receptive, or somewhere in between. We don't have any way to tell how the, so, um, how the soil is going to respond to the seed. We don't know if it's rocky soil. We don't know if it's thorny soil. We don't know if it's good soil. All we know is it's soil. It's somebody's heart. The results are the same. The sower sowed the seed. It landed on the ground. It germinated and began to grow. The seed is accepted, and it begins to germinate into a new plant. It looks the same, whether you're talking about the rocky soil or the thorny soil or the good soil. The difference is how they produce. The difference between the three soils ultimately is in their production. It's in, and the sower has no way to know about the soil. As a seed sower, a person who is, we are called to make disciples, and we're, our responsibility is to make sure the soil is ready for the seed. The soil belongs to God. The role of the Holy Spirit prepares the heart. God, can He change the soil? Can God change the soil? It's not rhetorical. Yes? Can God take thorny soil and make it good soil? Yes. See, our challenge as seed sowers is don't worry about the soil. That's God's responsibility. 
sow the seed. <clears throat> My second observation is this, that a disciple is about making disciples. Now, look at verse 5. <coughs> look what the sower is doing. The sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed. All right, it's rather redundant. The sower went out to sow the seed, and so he sowed. This is what he's doing. He's a seed sower. Look at verse 8. And some of the seed fell on good soil, and it grew and yielded a hundredfold. What are the results of seed sowing? Seed laying on good soil produced a hundredfold. A hundredfold. That's a seed sower sowing seeds that produces fruit, which yields more seeds. This is the objective. This is the goal. A gardener is not only about producing a harvest of fruit and vegetables that they can consume as part of their normal dietary intake, but a good gardener is also about producing enough seed that they can grow a garden next season. You grow a garden, you harvest the fruit and vegetables, you harvest seed so that you can plant more. You harvest more seed so you can plant more. A gardener is not just about growing fruit. It's also about growing seeds. You know, it's interesting if you grow a, I like tomatoes. Take a nice sliced tomato on some white bread with a little mayonnaise, a little salt and pepper. I'm telling you, that is good eats right there, right? I like tomatoes. But I don't know if you know this or not. You take a little bitty tomato seed, you put it in the ground, and it grows into a plant. And lo and behold, if that plant doesn't produce lots of tomatoes, and in every one of those tomatoes are a buku of seeds. One seed produces lots of fruit that contains lots more seeds, which contain more fruit, which could produce more seeds, which could produce more fruit. You understand? You get the multiplication process here? The reality is that seed sowing is not just about growing a harvest. It's about multiplicity. It's about multiplying. It's about the ability to take one seed and it germinate in the life of someone that turns into the life of germinating into someone else that affects someone else that sows into someone else. In Jesus' day, you couldn't go down to the local Home Depot and buy a bunch of hybrid plants and come home and stick them in the ground and expect to grow some plants. You know, you couldn't stroll down to the tractor supply store and grab you a big old bag full of seed and go out and plant some seed. You had to make sure that you kept enough seed from last year's crop so that you could plant next year's crop, right? I mean, this is the way horticulturally gardening should work, right? A seed sower is interested not only in building fruit, but he's also interested in creating more seeds. Around here, we call that disciple makers. <clears throat> We're all about making disciples and helping people become a disciple maker because disciple makers make disciples. Yes? If I'm a disciple maker, I'm making other people who are like me, who are disciples, who make disciples, who then in turn find other people to turn into disciple makers who make disciples. I'm not interested in just producing more cheeks in the seats. I'm interested in producing disciple makers who are making disciples. I want more seed sowers who are sowing seeds. The Great Commission is for each one of us to be a seed sower, right? That's what the commission is. As you're going, make disciples. As we go through our day, we meet people. We should be about making disciples. Paul talks about this role in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 6 and 7. He says this, I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Only God who gives the growth. I mean, the reality is sometimes our seed sowing is actually watering the seed. Somebody else came before me, put a seed in the ground. I come behind them, I add a little water to that seed. <clears throat> you continue to share the good news of the kingdom of God to that person, and they hear it from you again, and God gives growth. We're seed sowers. My whole life I read this parable and I focus on the dirt. It's focused on the wrong thing. It's actually about a parable <clears throat> about being a seed sower, not about finding out what kind of dirt you are. I fail to recognize the subject of the story. I fail to realize that without the seed sower sharing the good news of the kingdom of God, 
There is no seed to sow. And no seed falls on any soil. Here's my third observation. The Word of God is the seed we sow. Now, I know you're going, duh. But no, this is an interesting point. The Word of God is the seed we sow. As Jesus explained the meaning of the parable, he tells us in verse 11 that the seed is the Word of God. So it begs the question, what is the Word of God, right? The seed is the Word of God. All right, what's the Word of God? <clears throat> so we need to know what we're to be sharing if we're going to be good seed sowers. In order to make disciples, we need to know what seed we should be sowing. The Word of God. Well, that <clears throat> seems obvious and intuitive. <clears throat> Jesus makes a simple statement and then just kind of moves right on, right, as if you should know what I'm talking about and as if it's a no-brainer, you know. Hey, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's the Word of God. His emphasis on the Word of God is so minimal that it's as if the disciples knew exactly what he was talking about. And I think they did. I think they understood exactly what he meant when he said the seed is the Word of God. You know, since Jesus started his ministry and began teaching, he's been saying the same thing over and over and over again. <clears throat> his message has been the same. The words he used to get to the message may differ a little bit, but he's been saying the same thing. Since chapter 4, we see Jesus declaring in the synagogue that he was fulfillment of the prophecy all the way to chapter 8. <coughs> we see him saying, the good news of the kingdom of God is here. The gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news of the kingdom of God is what Jesus is all about teaching, which simply is the gospel. This is the word of God. This is the message. This is our seed. This is what we should be sowing. <clears throat> this is what we should be sharing. This is what we should be telling people. The good news of the kingdom of God is that Jesus has come. He lived with us. He died for us. He rose from the dead. And he's made it possible for us to have a relationship with God. He is our Savior. <coughs> this is the gospel. This is the good news. Sin has lost and Jesus has won. This is the seed. This is the good news. Sow it. But how? <coughs> how do we become broadcast indiscriminate seed sowers of the gospel? You know, over the past few weeks, Jeff has been sharing with us the idea that we should be missional. And that's not, let's go on a mission trip together. It's about living our everyday life on mission for King Jesus. And as we believe right here, we say this all the time, we believe that when the Word of God is spoken and it's preached, it demands a response. So I, trying to be a good disciple and living out what we say we believe, <clears throat> I began to try to figure out how do I put that in. How do I, Alan Smith, do what he's talking about? How do I, how do I put this into practice? And it began, I began asking some low, just basic questions. Questions. How do I start a question? How do I start a conversation with my server at the restaurant about Jesus? How do I open, how do I how do I even begin these conversations? How do I how do I do this? I was actually to have a conversation with a friend the other day, and this was the, this was the crux of his converse, of the conversation. I don't even know where to start. <clears throat> so that's good. That's that's a good honest question. I don't know where to start. Well, good. Very good place to start. Right, start at the beginning, right? Let's start at the beginning. Let's ask some just fundamental, basic questions. <clears throat> Matter of fact, the other day, um, my wife and I and my son, we were out to dinner. And again, thinking this stuff, putting this into practice, not just letting it be something that happens in here. How do I take what I've been hearing out there and use it? So we're sitting at, at a restaurant, and our server comes up to serve us, and Hey, how you doing? And I like to ask people questions. Hey, where are you from? What are you doing? Oh, your name. I got your name. Her name was Alice. And she was serving us, and um, she took our drink order, and then she came back. And <clears throat> I asked her, I said, um, when she took our meal order, I said, Alice, we're going to say the blessing over our meal here in just a moment. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And immediately she's like, yes, my, my dad has just been diagnosed with leukemia. Okay, well. We took her hand, and my wife took her hand, and, and we prayed for her right there over in the restaurant as we were waiting um, for food to be delivered. She 
comes back a little bit later with food. And over the course of our conversation, you go to church anywhere. Well, yeah, I go to church in town. Really? We know so-and-so. Tell them we said, hey, hi. <clears throat> over the course of our meal, she'd come to the table and she'd go to everybody else's table, not trying to interrupt her day or make her have a bad work experience. Her bosses get on to her. I just was trying to ask questions. Where are you from? What do you do? Do you know Jesus? Uh, yeah, no, okay, well, maybe we could. And in doing so, we, I had the opportunity as our family to just minister to her. Now, it wasn't hard. I mean, we weren't, we didn't do anything extraordinary. I just tried to put into practice what, what we've been, what's being, being preached here on Sundays. Okay, I'm supposed to put it into practice. All right, how do I put this into practice? This is a way. Let me, let me be on mission today. I'm at Red Lobster. Let me be on mission. When we develop, we're going to develop relationships. We're going to run in contact with people. We're going to see people every day. And when you're at the restaurant, be on mission. You know, the, the highlight of that moment, though, was not the conversation I had with her. The highlight of that moment was when my son leaned over to me and said, Dad, we need to tell more people about Jesus, don't we? Yes. You want to talk about a moment? My son got it. Now, now not only are we teaching and hearing it from the word here, when we take it out there, now it becomes application. And lives begin to change. Alice was blessed. I was blessed. Our family was blessed. Why? Because we were trying to be missional trying to sow a seed and got to minister to somebody. Being about Jesus' mission is our calling. This is what we are to do. It's our purpose. Be on mission by sowing seed. Paul tells us about this in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 16. He says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe and whom they have not heard. And how are they to hear without a preacher? And how are they to preach unless someone sends them? For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, the gospel. And they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So listen to this. Faith comes from hearing. And hearing the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I want to share a tool with you. <coughs> this is something that we have developed to put into the app. It's not anything unique. It's just an opportunity for us to be hopefully a better seed sower. If you have the app, I'd like for you to open it up. And I want to introduce you to a, a function of our church app that I hope help will eventually give you the opportunity to be a better seed sower. How can they hear? How can they believe unless someone tells them? They need to hear. We need to be seed sowers sharing the gospel. But the soil is God's responsibility. So on our app, you'll notice there's this little green bar at the bottom, depending on how you look at it or flip it, it's sideways, whatever. It says, share Jesus. Now, I don't know if you ever clicked that button or not, but if you do, it takes you to a screen that should look something like this. The idea is, let's put the gospel in front of people's eyes. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to walk through this with you because I want to demonstrate to you how hard this is. It's incredibly hard. I mean, like, super-duper hard. I mean, it's, like, simple, right? Super simple. I want to share with you a method, a way, a way to be a seed sower to someone when you have the opportunity and you are given the chance. Here's a little tool that we put together <clears throat> for you. So if faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God, here's what I would do. This is what I would do. I would ask the person I'm, I'm sitting there talking to to read the verse out loud. Faith comes by hearing, so I'd like for you to hear the verse. But I am going to do as little as I possibly can because whose responsibility is the soil? God's, right? The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to convict, to save, to bring people to Him, not me. I can't save anybody, right? I barely keep my head above water sometimes. I can't save somebody else. Here's the deal. So what I, here's what I would do, and I'm going to ask you <clears throat> to be my representative person, okay? 
So here's what I do. I would ask you, would you read this verse out loud? So let's all read it together. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then I would ask the person. I would say, what does this verse mean? And then I would just be quiet. And I would let them answer me. They may say something like, uh, it says that if you've sinned, you don't measure up to God. Okay, that's right. Then I'd go to the next verse. Now, if they gave me some really wacky answer, you know, I may go, um, how about reading that one more time? <coughs> right? Would you read this out loud? But if they're, gonna, if, they, if they're honest with you, they'll tell you what this means, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. It looks like everybody's a sinner and we, we don't measure up to God. Okay, let's look at the next verse. Then you slide to the next verse. When you slide to the next verse, you got Romans 6, 23. And then I would ask them, would you read this out loud? So let's read it out loud. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then I would ask them the question, what does this verse mean? And they may answer something like, um, I get paid, sin brings me, makes me death, I die because of sin, and I can have life with Jesus. Look at the next verse. All right. John 3 3. Read this verse out loud. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, <clears throat> unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does this verse mean? And they'll look at it and they may say, Well, unless I'm born again, I don't know what that means, but unless I'm born again, I can't see God's kingdom. All right. Good. Let's read the next verse. I'd slide to the next verse, <clears throat> John 14, 6. And I would ask them, would you read this verse out loud? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I would ask them the question, what does this verse mean? And they'll say something like, I guess the only way to get to God is through Jesus. Okay, good. Let's read the next verse. Romans 10, 9. Would you read this out loud, please? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with one, how one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And I would ask the question, what does this verse mean? Hopefully they would say something like, um, "Jesus was raised. God was raised from the dead. And Jesus came back from the dead, and I can be saved if I believe in Him and if I confess with my mouth something that He says there." Okay, you, you got it. You're... What does the next verse say? I'd go to Second <clears throat> Corinthians five, and I would ask them to read this verse out loud, and they would say, "He died for all." that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who their sake died and was raised. And I would ask the question, what does this verse mean? Now, notice, I am not imposing. I am simply trying to sow the seed and let God be responsible for the soil. I'm not trying to make an argument. I'm not trying to pose uh, any kind of challenging, thought-provoking questions. I'm simply trying to let the seed let the Word do what the Word, and let the Holy Spirit do His thing. And I would ask him, what does this verse say? He said, well, it says that He died for everybody, I guess me too, so that we could live with Him. Okay, right? He died for everybody. Now flip over here, Revelation 3.20. <clears throat> and I would ask him to read this verse out loud. Read out loud. He would say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. And I would ask the question, what does this verse mean? And they would say maybe something like, well, if I let him into my heart, then he will come and if I let him into my life, um, maybe he'll come in and be with me. Okay. So at this point, the, the seed has been sown or maybe the seed has been watered. <clears throat> and if, if you ask these questions, it's now time to ask for a response. <clears throat> you've sown the seed. You've shared the gospel. You have shared the good news of the kingdom of God. 
We've presented the gospel by letting the word of God be the word of God. And we're letting the Holy Spirit do his work. So then you ask, you ask this person a couple questions. I'm going to ask you a question. Would you like to respond to Jesus today? Would you like to do that? Would you like to respond? Now, if they say yes, wonderful. Then ask them another question. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Well, yeah, I believe that he is Lord. I just read that. Okay. Do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, yeah, that's what it said. I believe that too. Excellent. If they can say yes to those three questions, then we have sown seed. It has landed on some soil, and it is beginning to germinate. So if they ask yes to these questions, we then need to offer them a prayer of confession. The Bible says, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> right? I need to make this confession. Needs to be... So here's what I'd like to do. If you are in this room today, and this, as we've read through these verses, you have had that um, internal thing happening in your life, and you're kind of, I don't know, maybe this is me. Maybe I need, I'd like to respond to this today. I haven't had this before. I want to offer a prayer of confession for you. For the rest of you in the room, this is an example. This is just a prayer of confession. But let's, I want to pray. Let's pray. I want to pray this prayer. <clears throat> and if, if this is you in the room today, in your heart, Pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I confess my sin to you today. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, that you rose from the dead, and I ask you to come into my life as my Lord. I surrender my life to you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, welcome to the family of God. Please let us know. There's a, there's a little place on our next steps, and that little card on your worship guide. Where you can little put a box there, let us know. Our pastor will be in the welcome center after the service today. He would love to talk to you. He has a gift. He'd love to share some stuff with you and kind of help you know what the next steps are. What do you do next? All right, I believe. Now what do I do? Please, before you leave, speak with our pastor in, in the back. We believe around here that whatever the word is preached, <clears throat> that it demands a response. We call this our next steps. Our next steps today is this. Yes, I, I, I want to be a seed sower. I commit my life to Jesus. If that's you today, praise the Lord. Amen, hallelujah. I'm glad that is you. Or maybe you would say, I'll use the word of God to spread the gospel and make disciples. Maybe you're realizing today you're not being a seed sower. You're not sharing the good news. Or maybe you say, I need to stop worrying about the results of the seed. God is responsible for the soil. And let God do what God is called to do. How do you respond to the word today? There's an opportunity for you to respond in the worship guy. I pray that you do so. Tear that off, put that in the offering plate when it's passed in a little bit. But God has called us to respond to his word. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your love and mercy and the privilege we have to serve you and the opportunity, Lord, uh, we have to, to share your word and to spread the good news of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you be with us this morning. I pray that you would challenge our hearts, that we would leave this place different than when we came in. <clears throat> Lord, and that as we do so, uh, Lord, your kingdom would be made known and that the good news of the gospel would be spread around this city. And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.